The number of NHS workers on sick leave, is that tricky or is it catastrophic from your experience? Well, I'm afraid to say it's catastrophic. Um, you've got uh, 3,874 people off sick in London hospitals. Um, so drafting in 200 army personnel is going to be a drop in the ocean. Now, those 200 will work very hard and the 40 of them are medically trained, and they'll be of immense help on the wards and departments they're working in. But it's a tiny contribution uh, to, to, towards what is a major, major crisis facing the NHS in London. And it's a similar picture across the four countries of the UK. Indeed, the fact that there were 60 in Scotland was pointed out to me on social media as well. But, but looking at these pictures um, uh, of service men and women, uh, it's worth remembering that there are already a lot of them out there helping with jab centres and things like that. Do you sense that the Ministry of Defence have reached the limit of what they can offer the NHS? Yeah, look, there's not a lot of slack in, in the system uh, in the army. Um, and certainly when you had the two major conflicts, conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, the medical defence services were highly dependent on reservists who already work in the NHS. Uh, and I went out to Iraq and I also went to Afghanistan. And on the uh, times I went there, the two deployments, uh, the field hospitals were staffed almost entirely by people from the NHS. So the Army Medical Defence Services are actually quite small. As I say, it's fortunate that we haven't got two major conflicts going on at the moment, and it's right that those people are redeployed to help out the NHS. But as I said, look, it's a drop in the ocean. Uh, 40 medics in London, uh, 160 uh, backup staff, all doing good work compared to nearly 4,000 people off sick. It's not really going to make that uh, big a difference, Alistair. Really, you said 3,874, I think, in London. Yeah. Jer Jeremy Hunt's Health and Social Care Committee reported very recently that in addition to those COVID sicknesses and perfectly reasonable days off, and we don't want them infecting folk, that there is an estimated 93,000 vacancies within the NHS anyway and widespread shortages. So y you said you think that the, the COVID situation is pretty catastrophic. But when we wrestle with waiting list problems and there are 93,000 vacancies, I mean, the government at best are putting a brave face on this, aren't they? Well, they are indeed. And also what they're also doing is they're disregarding the catastrophic effects of the cuts in the NHS in the first few years of the coalition government. By way of example, because we've been talking about London, in 2012, there were 2,000 training places per year for nurses. That got cut by 25% to 1,500. Now, 2,000 is barely enough to stand still to cope with retirements. So by cutting it by 25% to 1,500, London is now paying the price for that. So they're playing catch-up. And it's what I called when I was at the Royal College of Nursing, yo-yo workforce planning. Uh, they make these cuts to save money, but ultimately it costs lives and it puts the services under greater pressure than it had been before. And because of what's now gone on with COVID, there is no slack in the system. If those 90,000 vacancies were filled, there would be a, a bit of a cushion to be able to cope with this. And that's why so many hospitals are now declaring that they're in a critical state um, and that means they're going to have to cancel even more elective surgery. So those waiting lists, which are already uh, huge, uh, will increase that much more. And it's going to be very commonplace for people waiting for hips, knees, hernias and many other conditions to be waiting two, three and God forbid, maybe as long as four years. Yeah. And, yeah. and th those people, their health will deteriorate even more. So it's a pretty desperate state of affairs. Um, the other thing that, that literally terrifies me, and, and you know this having previously been the boss of the Royal College of Nursing, but it applies to nurses, junior doctors, let alone consultants, it takes years to train up good men and women who want to do that job. So 
extending waiting lists and what have you, you you're talking about three, four, five, six, seven years before we can get fully up to steam. It will, it will be many years. And, uh, and, and as I said, and the problem is, the longer you're waiting, the more your condition will deteriorate. So even something as relatively nowadays straightforward as a hip replacement, the longer you're waiting for that, the more deterioration there will be of the capsule, uh, the more mobility problems that you will have, and people will end up having problems with their knees, their backs. And so it's a downward spiral. And this is now, the, the we are now reaping the bitter harvest of those short-term cuts, particularly in the 2010, 2011, 2012 era, which, uh, which is causing these huge problems, compounded uh, by COVID, but it would have been difficult even at the best times. We're now dependent on going overseas to recruit people. There's nothing wrong with people com coming from overseas. But for me, there's something ethically wrong with going off to developing countries and raiding their impoverished uh, uh, health services that they've paid to train these people in order to bail out our service. So we're going to be dependent on overseas recruitment for years to come. And the other thing, Alistair, to say, and I know your viewers, there are too many stats just probably <laughs> befuddles people, but there are 700,000 nurses and midwives on the register. 150,000 of those are over the age of 55. And in the next five to six years, they are going to retire. I mean, it's absolutely irrefutable. They will retire. So the workforce crisis will get even worse. And I absolutely uh, commend Jeremy Hunt, the former Secretary of State, who's been doing a lot of work with the Health Select Committee, and I think he's been doing a very good job there, who is calling on his own government to now do something proper and constructive about workforce planning and yeah. to publish exactly where we are. So it's a very, very depressing and very bleak state of affairs. Having said that, and I've been to two hospitals this week, I am so impressed with not just nurses, but it's people like porters, domestics, receptionists, um, physiotherapists, doctors, I could go on, really all hands to the pump, yeah. really pulling out all the stops. But the, the exhaustion factor is something which is really taking its toll.